you've been sharing this month on Pentecost. And so I'm going to be going in that direction too this morning. So we can turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. As I speak on Pentecost and the fullness of the Spirit. Pentecost and the fullness of the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Shall we pray? Lord, I ask you to speak to your people. Use me as your vessel and your mouthpiece this morning. I pray that I will not speak my own word. I ask Holy Spirit that as I share you with your people, that you will speak through me, you will minister to them. Lord, that this word will not just be a doctrine, it will be an encounter with a person of the Spirit of God. That no one under the sound of my voice will remain the same, having heard this word this morning. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I'm asking you that you will help us to embrace the Holy Spirit and allow him to work in our lives so that we can be exactly uh, who we ought to be in the name of Jesus Christ. I receive utterance, I receive unction this morning. Thank you, Lord, for in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now that passage says, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation but be filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe we have heard so much about the Holy Spirit. I don't need to be going back again to tell us about um, his person, but I know the Holy Spirit is not a doctrine. The Holy Spirit is a person that we need to relate with. All right? It's a person that we need to work with. And the understanding of his personality and of his ministry will make a lot of difference for us as believers as we walk on this side of eternity. And the Bible is commanding us, I believe it's not advising us, it's commanding us to be filled with the Spirit. Because there is no other way you are going to be a Christian if you are not filled with the Spirit. There's no way you are going to be a victorious Christian. There's no way you are going to be an obedient Christian. There is no way you are going to be a triumphant Christian except you are filled with the Holy Spirit. That is why when Jesus was going, he told his disciples, he said, I will not leave you orphans. Because without the fullness of the Spirit, we will be helpless. An orphan is an helpless person who has lost his or her parents. And so he's at the mercy of others. He's at the mercy of circumstances. Because the parents are supposed to take care of a child and bring that child up to the point where he can become independent and take care of himself. All right? But when you lose your father and your mother at a very tender age, it life becomes difficult. And so God is saying... And Jesus is saying, I don't want you to live this Christian life struggling. I want you to live it as someone who has a helper. So the Holy Spirit is a helper. Okay? So we are not asked to be struggling to be believers. We are not asked to be struggling to obey God. We are not asked to be struggling to live the Christian life. He we're just be told that the way to live that life is to be filled with that spirit. And so that is the message I'm bringing to us this morning. What does it mean to be filled with the spirit? It means to be made full with the spirit. Don't forget when you give your life to Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. And it's living in you. Okay? And it's not living in us to be a passive you know, participant in our life. He's living in us to be active. He's in us to take over. Because until he takes over, struggles continues. Until he takes over, we will not be able to live the life. There is a life that we are supposed to live as believers. As he, until we are full of him, we won't be able to live that life. So it's, the Bible is telling us, be filled. With the spirit, be made full. It's like when you pour water into a cup and that cup is brimming with water. That is what it means to be full. It says be full. Be full until there is no place for you, for self, for flesh anymore. And it's all about the spirit of God. That's what it means to be, full, to be filled. It means to be generously supplied with. To be generously supplied with the Holy Spirit. Okay? That his fullness is released in our lives. That's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It means to be taken over by. It 
means he can take over your personality and live his life through your personality. That he takes charge of our lives. That is what it means to be filled. It means to be overcome by the Spirit. It means that you follow the leadings and the directions of the Holy Spirit no matter how you feel. That's what it means to be filled. It's no longer what you want. It's no longer where you want to go. It's no longer what you want to do. It's what he wants you to do. It's where he wants you to go. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. He takes charge. He takes control of our lives. It means to be under the influence of. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we come under his mighty influence. We come under his ruling influence. We come under his controlling influence. And I'm telling you, until we come to that level, Christianity becomes a struggle. And we are wondering whether, whether this thing is real. Alright? And it's real. It's just that we are not getting to the point where it will become normal. To be a Christian. No man to please God. No man to do the will of God. Because there is a force that is working in us that will make that possible. Amen. Amen. And that passage is, 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 is you know, this is um, a put being drunk with wine side by side with being filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? And it's trying to, you know, as if it's comparing being drunk with alcohol with being filled with the spirit, all right. So when a man is is drunk with the spirit, I mean drunk with wine. You know there are different levels of of being drunk. There is a level of being excited by the by alcohol. You just drink it to a level you are not your real self, but you are still in control. There's another level of being slightly intoxicated. You start losing control little by little, but you are still in control. All right. Then you get to a point where you are intoxicated and you come under the influence. Of the of alcohol, all right, and then you are overwhelmed and overpowered by alcohol. At that level, you are not aware of yourself anymore. That's why you see someone who is drunk can lie on the road, and everybody is looking at you and they are mocking. He's not aware; he has lost self awareness because he's overpowered by the Holy Spirit, by by wine. And that is is comparing that that we can come to a point where it's no longer about ourselves anymore. It's about the Spirit of God. It's about the will of God. It's about the counsel of God. It's about the purpose of God. We can come to that point. We can come to a point where we don't care what people say anymore. You know, there are many people they are not obeying God because of what we people say. They are so we are so aware of ourselves, okay? And God is saying we need to move beyond that point to the point where the Holy Spirit takes over our personality and it begins to live the life because there is the life we must live. He begins to live that life in and through us. Amen. We see Jesus as our example. If there's anybody who should not be filled with the Spirit, it should be Jesus. The Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. But I, I want to announce to you that when Jesus came to the earth, he came walking, living, and all he did, he did by the Holy Spirit. And I believe one of the reasons why he did that is to make, give us an example. Because it's our perfect example. If Jesus needed to be filled with the Spirit, then we need to be even be more filled with the Spirit. Okay? And the passage we read during our Bible study, in Luke chapter 4, verses, I will read verses 1 and 2. He said, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. Look at what happened. He says, and Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. Now, it becomes difficult to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit leads us sometimes in some strange paths. Some of the time, the paths we don't want to go as persons, but that is the path of God for our lives. That is the path of God for our destiny. All right? And we don't like to take shortcuts. We like to take easy paths. But, but that's not the way of God. The way of God is for us to go the whole length. All right? And to face whatever challenges are on that path. Now, if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, you will not follow the Holy Spirit. 
If he has not taken you over, if he has not come to a point where you cannot say no anymore, then he won't be able to lead us because when he begins to lead us in some strange path, we're going to tell him, no, I don't want to go this path. Can you imagine? Jesus had just, you know, had an encounter with John the Baptist and the Holy Ghost came upon him and God declared, this is my son in whom I were placed. And the Bible says from that point, the only way we, we have a place to go. Took him from among the crowd. Took him from where things are happening. And he led him to the wilderness. A solitary place. Where there would no other person. Alright. And then he left him there to be tested by the devil. This some of the time, you know, if we don't read our Bible very well, we have some theologies that are not consistent with the Bible. Because we don't feel that, that the Holy Spirit can lead us in the pathway of test. And yet, the Bible tells us that God tests the righteous. Listen to this. God cannot trust you if he has not tested you. So, the Holy Spirit will lead you in the path where you need to be tested for your destiny. Where you need to be tested for what God has in store for you. See, there is a preparation that is needed. God is saying, can I trust this guy? Can I trust this guy? Can I trust this guy? Okay, let's take him through this path. And then the Holy Spirit begins to lead you. Now, when the Holy Spirit leads you in some paths that is not comfortable for you, you will not follow him. See, I, I'm not going to any wilderness. I'm staying in town. I'm going to enjoy myself, all right? But sometimes it leads us in some strange path where we will need to deny ourselves. The Bible says when Jesus was led in that path, he, he took a fast. He was tested. Jesus was tested. Now, it is easier to follow the Spirit when we are filled with the Spirit. When we are under His control, it becomes easy to follow is leading. Now, also, when we are under its influence, it's easier to endure the tests. Listen, life is not a bed of roses. Don't think that being a Christian is an escape route from life challenges. No. That is lie of religion. Oh, that I'm a child of God. I won't face any challenge. No, until you leave this planet ahead, you will face challenges. Jesus said, in this world, you will have troubles. He didn't lie to us. He didn't say it's going to be, it's going to be bed of roses. All right. He said, you will have challenges. He said, but be of good chairs. I have overcome the world. That no matter what happens, I'm going to see you through. So he doesn't accept us from life challenges, but when we are filled with the spirit, we have capacity to endure whatever we have to endure until the purpose of God for exposing us to those challenges is done. Amen. Amen. Okay. So it becomes easier to endure. The tests, the life challenges, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Also, it's easier to stick to the word solution. Don't forget when the enemy came and he began to test Jesus. If you are the son of God, turn to, turn to bread. How did Jesus respond? It is written. He said, John, if you are the son of God, jump from the you know, pinnacle of the temple. He says, it is written. He said, if you are the son of God, bow the knee and I will give you everything. And this word, he said, it is written. Listen to this. When you are filled with the spirit, it becomes easier to stick to the word solution. The word may be offering you all manner of solution to whatever challenges you are facing. And those challenge, those solutions look palatable. They look the easy way out. And God's ways sometimes are not the easy way out. But when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you submit to the solution of the world. Say, I am not going to follow the multitude to solve this problem they are solving it because I'm a child of God. I can't do it because I'm a child of God. I can't live like that because, because I'm a child of God. I can't take the shortcut because I'm a child of God. Now, it becomes easy to stand like that when you are filled with the Spirit of God. When He's in control of our lives. Say, Amen. Now, the fullness of the Spirit is our heritage. As sons and daughters of God, in John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39, it says, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him will receive. 
For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was, was not yet glorified. He said he was talking about the Holy Spirit that all who believe in him will receive. Okay, so if you are a child of God, you have received the Spirit of God because you can't even be a child of God without receiving the Spirit of God. You have received the Spirit of God. Now he's now saying that it can become a, a river. A river to swim in. A river that takes over your life completely. Okay? It's our heritage to be filled with the Spirit. And we saw the Holy Ghost came in, in Acts chapter, chapter, chapter 2. That was the way the day of, of Pentecost had come. The disciples were in the same, you know, were in the same place. Alright? And then there was a rushing mighty wind from heaven. And he entered the house where they were, about 120 disciples. And then he, he came upon them and then he filled them. The Bible said they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That was the beginning. That was the coming, the invasion of the Holy Spirit upon the earth for the church, for you and I, as the promise of the Father. So he had come for you. He had come for me. He had come to live in us. He had come to take possession of us. Bible says we are his temple. We are his dwelling place. He is in control. And then he has to be brought to that point where he takes charge. Until he takes charge, we will never be in charge. Do you hear what I said? Oh, there's so many things in this world that are out of our grief and we're trying to get that. Until he's in charge, we will never be in charge. Okay? So he's been sent to live in us and live with us and fill our lives with his fullness and take us over so that it becomes easy for us to follow him wherever he leads. Amen. The Bible says as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Following the leading of the Holy Spirit is a sign of maturity and until he fills you up, a child can't follow the leading of the Holy Spirit because he will always be contesting the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because there are so many things that God will be asking you to do and paths he will be asking you to go. He might not explain to you. When he told Abraham, he said, go to the place I will show you. He didn't tell him from who? The place. Now, if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be telling him, tell me the place first of all. And God said, when you get on the way, then I will tell you. Alright? Sons follows the Spirit. Sons are filled with the Spirit. So being a son is a sign, is a sign of maturity. Okay? And there's no way we're going to be mature if we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, I just you know enumerate one or two things because of our time. Some of the things that we experience when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. The first one I want to talk about is holy boldness. Holy boldness. If you are filled with the Spirit, you will be bold. Listen, there are so many things that terrify people on the earth. If God says, fear not, be not afraid, fear, and we have been told that about 365 places, God keeps saying fear not. It means there are things to fear. It means there are things that will terrify you. It means there are things that want to subdue you. It means that want to frustrate you and depress you. All right? And so God is saying, Fear not. Now, if you are not going to fear, you need to be filled with the Spirit. When you are filled with the Spirit, you will be filled with boldness. Not bone face. <laughs> okay? Boldness that is coming from the inside. Okay? And, and, and when you are filled with boldness, you are able to live this life comfortably. There, fear has torment. That's what the Bible says. If you are in fear, you will be in torment. So you need to be free from torment of what is going to happen. Oh, what will happen to my children? What will happen to my spouse? What will happen to my marriage? What will happen to my business? What will happen to my health? And we are, we are, we are, we are surrounded with so many things uh, that we don't have no explanation of. And if you, if you let them get into your heart, they will, they, will, they will take over your heart and you begin to fear. All right? And if you are going to be free from those fears, because those fears are real, Challenges are real. If you're going to be free from them, you need to be filled with the Spirit. If you are not filled with the Spirit, you'll be filled with fear of what is happening on the earth. All right? And it's not getting better on the earth. It's getting worse on the earth. All right? So we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit to escape the fear 
that is all over the place that is tormenting people who are not allowing the Holy Spirit to take charge of them. Okay, if it's tormenting the unbelievers, that's okay. But if for us it should not, we should not be partakers of the fear of the world. But if we are not going to be, if we are going to be free from the fear of the world, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the disciples were preaching the gospel and then they were arrested, you know, when they healed the man at the beautiful gate in Acts chapter 3. They were arrested and then they were brought in before the Sanhedrin, okay, uh, 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 the policymakers and the rulers of, of Israel and they asked them to defend themselves, okay, and after they have defended themselves, they threatened them not to preach in that name anymore. Acts chapter 4 verses 29 to 31. Now, Lord, now they went back the disciples went back and they began to pray. Now look at their prayer. They said, now Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. They, they, they dare the threat. They defy the threat. They were filled to the point that they were no longer afraid. Listen to this. When you have been warned and threatened, if you preach, we throw you into jail. Okay? That is a threat. And you know that the threat is real. Brother, you want to stop preaching. But when the Holy Ghost came upon, comes upon you, you don't fear the threat. You don't fear consequences anymore. As long as you are doing the will of God, you don't fear the consequences anymore. You need to be bold. God wants to bless you financially and he's asking you to give a particular amount of money that is threatening. You need to be bold. People who say, if I die, if I die, I die. In the scriptures, they never die. If you're afraid, you will never be able to do the will of God. The will of God sometimes is not palatable. It's only children that think that you know, I've come to Jesus so that he'll be giving me food, he'll be giving me bread, I'll be sleeping, I'll be waking up, the enemy will not touch me. You know, that is the childish, childhood part of it. But when you begin to expose you, because he has a place he's taking you, and you need to be groomed and prepared, he begins to expose you. He begins to give you instructions and direction that are life-threatening. Hey, Amen. Uh, but when you are filled with the Holy Ghost, you don't even see the consequences. You just see the obedience. You just want to do the will of God at whatever cost. That is the beauty of being filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible said they went back. In fact, you see their prayer. They were not praying, oh God, deliver us from this threat. Oh God, you see, because when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, your prayer will change. It's not this prayer, prayer, religious, uh, petty, petty prayer. The thing you'll be asking God will be things that are that are lasting, things that have to do with His kingdom, things that have to do with your with His purpose for your life. You'll be asking for many things. They didn't say, oh "God, deliver us from their fear." They say, "Fill us with boldness, so that no matter what they will do to us, we will not stop doing what we know we should do." And the Holy Ghost in faith, afresh. And the Bible said they went out in spite of the threat that they have made. And they began to preach the gospel. Some of us, God can ask us to do business. He wants to move you to the next level of your financial prosperity. And he's telling you, do this. Okay? And you are thinking of, if I leave this one, I don't want to leave the certain for the uncertain. You are not filled with the Holy Spirit. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, even though the fear is real, but his influence in your life will arrest that fear and make you bold to do what he wants you to do. And until we are bold to do what he wants us to do, we never see what he has promised us come to pass. There are certain things that will require action of faith, daring faith, for you to step into what God says is yours. If you are afraid, you will be able to get there. Okay, so be filled with the Holy Spirit and part holy boldness unto us. Number two, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Give us attitudinal transformation. Attitudinal, you know, everything in life is about is about attitude. It's about attitude. How far God will help you is based on your attitude. How far men will assist you is based on your attitude. What will happen to you is your attitude. 
It's going to be affected by your attitude. What is happening to us is not, is not as important as what is happening in us. Okay? So, attitude is important. So, when you are filled with the Spirit, there will be a transformation of your attitude. I read a scripture to us, Acts, Acts chapter 5, verses 40 to 42. And the disciples agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles, sorry, they agreed with him, that is, uh, uh, when they wanted to kill the, the apostles, and then, you know, one of the leaders, one of the leaders of uh, of the uh, lead, one of the leaders in Israel told them that they should not do it. Okay, that they should leave them. And when you leave them, if it is of God, it will succeed. If it's not of God, it will fizzle out. Okay, so they agree with him. And when they are called for the apostles and beating them, you know, the first time they threatened them. This second one, they didn't just threaten them; they beat them. Okay, and then they commanded that they should not speak. In the name of Jesus and let them go. Verse 41. So they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Amen. Amen. Look at what happened. They were preaching. They were doing what God told them to do. And then they were arrested. They said, Shabby, we have warned you. Not to preach in this name anymore. So they brought out Cain. Public disgrace. They whipped them and whipped them and whipped them. And they said, if you do it again. What did the disciples do? The Bible says they turned when they leave that place. They began to rejoice. Where did you get such attitude from? You have just been disgraced. You have just been put to shame. You have just. For doing the will of God. They were not doing evil. They were not flogged for evil. <laughs> they were not stealing. They were not taking somebody else's wife. They were preaching the gospel. And that was what Jesus said they should do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. So while doing the will of God, they suffered. But the Bible says they had no regrets. How did they respond? They were rejoicing. Oh, what a privilege to be disgraced because of him. What a privilege to be put to shame because of him. What a privilege to be whipped for his sake. What a privilege to suffer obeying God. Listen, sometimes when we suffer obeying God, we, we regret obeying God. We suffer suffer for obeying God and then we are complaining. What is God doing? Shabby was the one who told me to do it. What is he doing that this is happening to me? No, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, your attitude about what is happening to you will be completely transformed. You don't see from human perspective anymore. You see from the Holy Ghost perspective. And the Bible says, when you suffer for his sake, he said rejoice because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Rejoice. He said just make sure that you don't suffer as a thief. You don't suffer as an adulterer. You don't suffer doing the wrong thing. He said, but if you suffer, obey me. Rejoice. That's a new attitude. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, your attitude will be completely transformed. Because you won't see things from the flesh part, a flesh side anymore. You won't see things through the eyes of men anymore. You see things through the eyes of the Spirit who is filled, who has filled you. Amen. And everything in this life is all about our attitude. It's all about attitude. It's the way you feel and the way you think that affects the way you behave. We don't see things the way they are. We see things the way we are. Okay? So two people can be sitting, looking at the same circumstances, and they are interpreting it differently based on their attitude. And when the Holy Ghost has filled your life, He gives you a new set of attitude. He completely transforms your attitude. You begin to look at things from different perspectives. If you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, the way you will see money, the way you will think about money, the way you will look about money, will be different from someone who is filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh yeah? You can't be filled with the Holy Spirit and have greed. It's not possible. Because there's a, there's a perspective that is making you to be greedy. Once that perspective changes, you become generous. It's just about change of attitude. It's the way you see. So the Holy Ghost, when he has filled you, it begins to turn your eyes to see through his eyes. Once your attitude are changing, your life is changing. Actually, the change of life is change of attitude. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. 
So that the things that, that embarrassed you before, the things, what will people say? It won't matter to you anymore. Why? Because doing the will of God is the most important thing. And if I suffer doing it, I rejoice. I just make sure that I don't suffer doing what is not the will of God. But if it's the will of God, I don't care. Okay? That is what is important. Number three, when you are full of the Spirit, you become effective in service. You become effective in service. There was a challenge in the, in the, in the first church in Jerusalem. Okay? There were about 5,000 members. That was a large church. Okay? And so, the Hellenist widows were complaining against the Jewish widow that they are not being taken care of as, as much as the Jewish widows were taken care of. So, it was, it was splitting the church. And the disciples, you know, the, the apostles, Call the old church together. Say, we are not going to allow this to, to break down the purpose and the counsel of God for this church. Now, he now said, this is what we are going to do. In, in, in verse, I will read from verse uh, 2. Acts chapter 6 from verse 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation. Fool! Of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continue to prayer and to the ministry of the world. Can you see? They want to appoint people to be serving food, and they say one of the one of the requirement is that they must be full, they must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Somebody is looking at what do you need that for? If you give anything to someone who is not filled with the Spirit, it's going to spoil it. He's going to mess it up. Because the things of the, of the spirit is different from the things of the flesh. Okay? It's different. It becomes more imperative in church that people who are filled with the spirit are needed for the work of God. Because they are not going to see the work of God from the human perspective. And they are not going to treat it like men's work. They are not going to think that they are doing pastor favor. Because see people serving in church, they think they are helping the pastor. No. The man who is filled with the spirit knows that he is doing the will of God. He is serving God. Amen. <laughs> you have to be filled with the spirit for, for you to serve well. And that is going to spill over to our secular work. Listen to this. If you are filled with the Spirit, the way you will do your work in the place of work, it will be different from the way an unbeliever does it. You know, on our side, you know, side of our, of our, of the world, they talk about, you know, whether you, whether you say or you don't say, your salary will be available. Some people will say, well, uh, it's not my business. I'm, I signed for eight to two. Once I do my work, I'm gone. I don't care what happens to this work. Now, the man who is filled with the Spirit won't do that. Because the man who is filled with the Spirit knows that he's the servant of Jesus wherever he's found. And so whatever is committed to his hand must not be spoiled. It must not be hard that we are ineffective in whatever we are asked to do. And there is no way we are not going to be ineffective if we are not filled with the Spirit. So when they want to appoint people to serve food, they said they must be filled. With the Spirit. And what happened after they were appointed to do that work in verse 7? He said, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. When men who were filled with the Holy Spirit were in charge of that, the Bible says that problem did not just solve, that crisis did not just solve, it led to explosion. The church began to grow. The church church began to grow because effective men were handling things in the church. They were filled with the Spirit. Amen. We need to be filled with the Spirit if we are going to be effective employees. We need to be filled with the Spirit if we are going to be, you know, good workers in the church. We need to be filled with the Spirit because the flesh will spoil the things of God. We need to be filled with the Spirit. Now let me take the last one before I now tell you how to access this fullness. When you are filled with the Spirit, you have easy access to the invisible. You have easy access to the invisible. In Acts chapter 7 verse 54 to 56, they were about to stone um, Stephen. 
for preaching the gospel. They gathered, you know, when he has preached that they, they were hungry and they wanted to kill him. They were they actually killed him. But I want you to see what happened, okay, even before they killed him. To tell you the implication of this being filled with the spirit. In verse 54, he says, When they heard these things, that is what he has preached to them, they were caught to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Amen. Amen. Somebody who was about to be stoned to death, he did not see death. He did not see threats. Listen to this. The crowd that gathered to kill him were many. Amen. The, the, the threat of death was real. Okay? But he was gazing at something else. He wasn't gazing at the threat of death. He was gazing. His gaze was different. And the Bible says, because he gazed towards heaven, he saw the glory of God. Because what you gaze at will determine what you will see. What you gaze at will determine what you see. If you gaze at poverty, you are going to see poverty. If you gaze at, at untimely death, that's what you'll be seeing. And it is going to put fear in your heart. If you gaze at, at things that terrify, that's what you're going to be seeing. The man who is filled with the Spirit is always seeing the things of the Spirit. The Bible said the man who set his mind on the things of the flesh is going, going to be walking according to the flesh. The man who set his mind on the things of the spirit is going to be walking according to the, according to the, according to the spirit. He said to be, to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So where do you gaze at? What do you gaze at? Do you gaze towards the heaven? Do we gaze towards the, the face of Jesus? Or what do we gaze at? What preoccupies our attention? What are the things that is holding our attention? That will determine what we see. So if Jesus is the one holding your attention, you are going to see the glory of God. When, when Jesus got to the house of, of Lazarus, and he said, roll away the stone, he told, he told you know, the people were there, roll away the stone. And then Martha said, sir, he's been dead for four days. His gaze was on death. Jesus said, Martha, have I not told you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? If you gaze at God, if you gaze at the realm of the spirit, if you gaze at the word of God, I'm telling you, what you will be saying will be different from what all the folks are saying. And what you are seeing will affect your life deeply. Deeply. So he said, I see the heaven. He says, uh, the heaven, as he gazed into the heaven, he saw the glory of God. He saw the intervention of God. He saw healing. He saw breakthrough. He saw divine intervention. That's what you should be seeing. A child of God must not think that he's going to be stranded. You can't be stranded. If you're a child of God. So you shouldn't be seen that. You should be, shouldn't be seen on timely death. You shouldn't be seen affliction. You, you should be seeing the things that God had promised. Because when you gaze your, your eyes on those things, that is what you'll see. As we behold his face, as in a glass, we are transformed. What you gaze at will change your life. So if you gaze at the realm of the invisible, the realm where God is, the realm where we walk by faith. I'm telling you, you are going to be seeing the glory of God. And you're going to be seeing Jesus. Okay. And we see Jesus. I see Jesus standing up. Jesus was actually sitting there. Don't forget. But when this man was coming in, Jesus had to stand up to welcome him. To welcome a soldier home. All right. He said, I saw. That's what I saw. That was why it was, it was easy for him to say, Lord, forgive them. Because they don't know what they are doing. All right, because he was seen differently. As sons and daughters of God, we need to see differently. And there's no way we're going to see differently if we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Because it's the one that helps us to gaze at the right thing, to gaze towards God, gaze towards the word of God, gaze towards the promises of God, in spite of what is happening around us. 
We don't care what is happening around us. We care about the promises of God concerning what is happening around us. Even though we are sick, what we see is healing and health. That's what we see. We don't gaze at the pain. We gaze at the healing. We gaze at the div divine intervention coming for us. When we don't have money in our pocket, we don't gaze at the empty pocket. We gaze at the promise of God. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. When you gaze at that, what you gaze on is what you see. Amen. So when you see a child of God who is exalted as if there is no problem in his life, it's what he's gazing at. It's not because he doesn't have problems. It's not because he doesn't need divine intervention. It's what he's gazing at reduce all the challenges to zero. Now my God will handle it for me. But when you shift your attention from God and you gaze at life challenges, my brothers and my sisters, they will terrify you. Because life challenges are real. But the promises of God are much better and much real. Amen. Amen. So how do we access the fullness of the Spirit, so that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. The first way is that we have to um, have the initial feeling. There is, there is the initial infilling. That's what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All right. After we have given our life to Jesus, we are prayed for, laid hands on, and then we are filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the initial feeling, because we can't be talking about this other feeling I'm talking about if you don't have the initial uh, feeling in Acts chapter 8, verses 14 to 17, Bible tells us that now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem had that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet they had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they lay hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. That is the initial. Okay? Infilling. That is the beginning. That's not the end. That is just the beginning. Many believers stand at the doorway of the Spirit and they never leave that point. Just because they can speak in tongues, they think that is the end of... No, it's not the end. It's the beginning. If you are going to be filled, because being filled with the Holy Spirit requires that you constantly be filled. Daily filling. Not just, just that one feeling. You see that the disciples, after they were filled in, in, in Acts chapter 2, it was not that only that, that, that time they were filled. They were filled several again. Okay? So, being filled once is not enough. Don't stay with that. You need to, to go ahead and follow up with daily feeling. You need to be filled daily until you are overcome by the Spirit. You need to be filled daily until you are overpowered by the Spirit. Okay, you need to be filled daily until you are mastered by the Holy Spirit. So the initial feeling is not enough. So we can still be speaking in tongues, and God said, This is where I want you to go. Say, God, it's not convenient for me. I'm not going that way. And yet you are speaking in tongues. You can still be speaking in tongues and still be stealing. You can still be speaking in tongues, and so you are not, you need to build it up. You need to come to a place where it takes you over. And so it begins to live the life of Christ through you. That is the point. Alright? And for that to happen, I read the last, chapter, last verse of the scripture for us. Luke chapter 24 verse 49. He said, Jesus said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. I want to play on tarry this morning on that passage. I want to play on tarry. And give us some of the synonyms of tarry and what we need to do for us to be taken over, to be overcome, to be overwhelmed, to be overpowered, and be beaten down to the point that we cannot say no to the Holy Spirit anymore. And once we know it's will, we don't care what the consequence will be. Once we know it's will, we don't care what is going to happen to us. Now, if it does not take you over, you will care what will happen to you. This self-awareness, trying to save yourself. Jesus said, he that tried to save himself, save his life, will lose it. Okay? So, we dare once we are fear. So, I will play on the word tarry this morning. Number one, tarry means hang around. So, you need to hang around the word of God. Talking about daily feeling, you want to be filled to the point that it takes you over. 
You need to hang around the world. Not just the one we preach in church. Not just the one we read in church. The one you also personally read and study and meditate on. Because the Holy Spirit will be helpless if you don't know the word of God. He can take you over if you don't know the word of God. You need to know the word of God personally. That's why Jesus said, he that fasts, you need to be thirsty. The man who is thirsty will be looking for water. He will not find rest until he finds water. That is why the things of the Spirit requires that you are thirsty for it. That you want it desperately. So once you want, want it desperately, there is nothing that is required to do that you won't do. And the first one is that you need to hang around the world. Daily intake of the word. Meditating, reading, studying, speaking the word of God. Alright? And faith comes by hearing the word of God. So you need to keep hearing from God as you stay in the world. Number two, tarry means to linger in. So you need to linger in praise and worship. Alright? I'm talking about things that will bring the Holy Ghost to take over your life. You need to linger. Praise and worship is not just something you do to just fill the space. You want to glorify God. You want to magnify God. You want to exalt and extol Him. And as you're doing that, the Holy Ghost will be invading your life and taking you over. I'm telling you, He's going to arrest your life if you expose yourself to God in praise and worship. As you begin to exalt Him, as you begin to extol Him, as you begin to adore Him, He begins to give you revelation. When you say, when you talk about faithfulness of God, He gives you revelation of what faithfulness means. Sometimes He gives you revelation, you break down crying. See, it's not just English. Mercy. He just, He just opened you up to know what mercy means in your spirit. Sometimes you just break down. Those are the things that help us to release ourselves to Him. So we're praising God, lingering in it. Don't do it as a religious activity. It's a time to exalt the king and to magnify the king. There's no way you'll be doing that. The Holy Ghost will not take you over. Because he loves God being exalted. He loves Jesus being glorified. So when we do that, he finds our lives a, a commodious place. A good place to inhabit. And then he begins to manifest himself in us. And he begins to take us over. So linger in praise and worship. What does that tarry mean again? It means to lounge in. L-O-U-N-G-E. Like a sofa. Where you sit on and it's comfortable. You need to lounge in the place of prayer. You need to be comfortable in the place of prayer. A lot of people don't like prayer. They see prayer more as a walk. No. Don't just see it as work. See it as fellowship. See it as you are coming to this, to somebody who loves you. God loves us. God cares for us. Even when we did not know him, he had loved us. And so he wants to share fellowship with us. It's a place of where the, where the weak comes to the strong to be helped. Okay? And then when we begin to come to that place, we are given the Holy Spirit opportunity to overflow us and overwhelm us. And also to encourage us, this praying in tongues, this initial, initial, you know, infilling where God gives us a gift of tongue. That tongue is power. So when you are praying, pray very well in tongues. Privately. The more you pray in tongues, the more the Holy Ghost will take you over. All right? All right? It's so very, very important. So our prayer life is important. If we are not praying, the Holy Ghost will not have any place in our lives. So. Okay? That's a platform where he arrests us. Number four, what does study means? It means to loiter. To be around. So loiter in fellowship. We are here this morning. We are fellowshipping to, together. All right? And Jesus said, we are two or three are gathered together in my name. I am there. There is a corporate anointing that always rests upon corporate gathering like this. Okay? So we are exposing ourselves to this corporate anointing every time we come together. To praise God together. To read the word of God together. To hear God's word together. God, the spirit of God begins to, you know, use that platform of fellowship to affect our lives. Okay, and the Bible says you have not just come to, you have not come to, you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. We are here right now. This is Mount Zion, the city of the living God. The, the saints who have gone ahead are here. Jesus is here. God the Father is here. The blood of the sprinkling is here. He's here to do work in our lives. Somebody who runs away from the church does not know what he's doing to himself. Except it is absolutely impossible 
to be to be in church. But to be to be possible, and you are sleeping at home when you should be in worship, in church, in worship, you are exempting yourself from the activity of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The last one this morning, what does tarry means? It means wait. Okay? So we wait in fasting. We begin to add fasting to our prayer. We begin to take time to skip our breakfast and skip our lunch and just wait upon God. Sometimes, you know, we may be influenced by the Holy Spirit to, to skip more than a day. Just do it. The more you do that, the more it takes over. The more you do that, the more it overwhelms you. It will come to a point you won't want to do anything in your life apart from what the Holy Spirit needs you to do. And once you are sure that it's the Holy Spirit that is leading you, you will not see the consequences that will come to you because you are obeying God. You will see the joy that will come because you are obeying God. I want to challenge us this morning. That all we have learned this month is not just doctrine. Because the Holy Spirit is not just doctrine. Don't just take it as something you write in your, in your notebook and leave it there. Begin to do those things uh, that uh, Pastor Godwin has, has shared with us. And some of the things I'm sharing with you this morning. And then you begin to see the Holy Spirit taking you over. And, 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 and overwhelming your life to the point that living the obedient life. Living the Christian life. Following God and doing the will of God becomes natural. Because it will no longer be you, it will be the Holy Spirit doing it in you. For it is not by might, it is not by power, but by my spirit. Say, Lord, let's bow our heads this morning and ask him to fill us afresh. Say, fill me afresh. Fill me afresh. He wants to fill us daily until we are overwhelmed. 